It is therefore with pleasure and great anticipation that I'm delighted to introduce Maggie Garrett, who will discuss current attacks on the wall of separation, the legislative landscape as seen from Washington. Maggie? Um, so yeah, so I run the legislative department at Americans United, and we have a staff of four people, and we both try to cover all 50 states, which is really challenging, because there's stuff that comes up all over the place, and they're sometimes hard to track because they have their own systems. And then we also lobby Congress, which uh, is taking more and more and more time these days. And we do a lot of work trying to influence um, the Obama administration in fixing some of the problems that they have not yet fixed um, and making some changes and, and making their policy decisions. So we do a lot um, in, a, in a big area uh, on these issues. <coughs> also, I apologize, I had a cold and I'm coughing. And I'll take a, I've got cough drops. If I, if I lose it. Um, so today I want to talk about um, some of the things that we work on. And if I were to talk on, about all of our issues, we'd be here for like three days. So if you look, we work on all sorts of issues. We work on some of the, the triggers that you think of. We work on creationism being taught in public schools. We work on religion issues in the military, whether it's clergy, sectarian prayers, um, proselytization by um, by the authorities and the military, we work on Ten Commandments monuments. We still see bills all the time about Ten Commandments. Prayer in schools, we see the traditional prayer in schools, we see these tricky maneuvers trying to get around what court decisions say, we spend a lot of time on that. Um, Sharia law bans, we see that, and of course, there's really no threat of Sharia law becoming law anywhere, especially in the states that decide to pass Sharia law bans. It's really all about feeding into Islamophobia, um, Bible is a, an official book. Um, the, we've seen that in three states this year. None of them passed it. Uh, religious oaths. We see this a lot in the military, um, other places about requiring people to give religious oaths. Uh, church candidate endorsements. We see you know, currently churches are just like all other nonprofits cannot endorse candidates. We see bills out there to try to change that, or even if they can't change it, to encourage uh, churches to violate the law. And we see money going out for religious programs all the time, whether it's um, you know, grantees or to build, help build, rebuild churches, things like that. So these are many of the things that we work on. But what I want to talk to you about today are the issues that we're spending the most time on at Americans United. And also some of the things like the refusal laws, which you guys are probably hearing the most about um, in the press. It's very exciting for us that these issues are making uh, the Sunday news shows. So when I talk about refusals, <coughs> Excuse me. I'm talking about the religious freedom bills you hear, the religious freedom bills, Indiana, Arkansas, you've been hearing a lot about. Um, they go into refusals to get marriage licenses, refusals to adopt to certain parents, and refusals to provide women's health care, insure women for health care, provide them information about health care. And then on the education side, we're seeing a lot of vouchers, tuition tax credits, that's something that's um, a discussion in New York. Um, and portability, which I'll tell you about, it's sort of a gateway to vouchers. Um, usually when I speak in the states, I try to come up and talk about as much of the state stuff as I can, but you are in New York, and it is a lot harder to find um, bills that are moving that are bad church state laws, because you normally sort of stop them. So you all have a few bills that were introduced that are good for church state separation, a few that were introduced that are bad for church state separation, but the only thing that has really moved this year is uh, tuition tax credits. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. So we'll start with the Re Religious Freedom Restoration Act. So this is what you're seeing talked about in Indiana and Arkansas, or what you did see talked about. Talked about. So what is this? Um, first I wanna go through, and you don't have to memorize that, I just sort of typed it out, but I wanna go through the history of RIFRAs, what they are, we, we call them RIFRAs, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Um, that's our church city um, little, um, way of talking about them. So, and people don't really understand where they came from. There's a lot of history there, there's a lot of confusion. You hear Bill Clinton like them, and President Obama approved them, and why is that a problem today? Where did they come from? So, pre-1990, if you had a free exercise case, which is First Amendment free exercise of religion cases, you would go to the court, and the court would apply what they call strict scrutiny. So they would say, is, your, is there a substantial burden on your religion? 
And if the answer was yes, they would say, does the government have a compelling interest to put that burden on you? And is the law narrowly tailored? This is one in con law that's like the, the hardest test to overcome. This is what free speech cases are, are held to. So it was strict scrutiny. And then in 1990, Justice Scalia wrote an opinion in a, a case called Employment Division versus Smith. And this was a case about someone who was Native American who smoked peyote for religious reasons, and they were fired from their job. And then they couldn't get unemployment because they had committed a crime, and that's why they were fired from their job. So they sued and said, you're denying me my unemployment benefits, but you're really violating my free exercise rights because I have to participate in these ceremonies in order to exercise my religion. So in a surprise to a lot of us, Justice Scalia said, we never applied strict scrutiny in any of those other free exercise cases. The way we wrote it, it kind of looked like that, but um, that's never what we did. Um, instead, we only apply strict scrutiny if the law is not, is not neutral and generally applicable. So a lot of people looked at this and said, you just wiped out years and years of free exercise law. And this is concerning because those, you know, a lot of us were on the side of the Native American who wanted to use peyote and said, you know, that's part of his religion. And there's no reason why you can't have an exemption and you can't be protected. So we, um, we teamed up with a lot of, I mean, it was a big range of groups. It was a, the Southern Baptists along with the um, Baptist Joint Committee, which are the Progressive Baptists and the ACLU and Americans United and People for the American Way, all of these different groups were supporting the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And essentially what this would do in our mind in 1993 is just simply reinstate, reinstate strict scrutiny as it was before Employment Division versus Smith. And if you looked at the um, congressional debates when they were passing this in Congress, we saw discussions about things, concerns like, what if you, um, what if you uh, belong to a religion that has communion and you, like me, I actually grew up in a, in a dry town. You live in a dry town, and they say, well, you can't serve communion wine. Well, you need something to protect that. Or what about an issue of kosher food? What if um, they pass public health laws that outlaw the way kosher food, you know, they want to perform, provide kosher food? That would be a problem. What about a kid who is in a public school, there's a rule, no hats, and the kid wants to wear a yarmulke, and they say no. Well, if it's neutrally and generally applicable without strict scrutiny, these kids aren't protected. And then they talked a little bit about hiring ministers, although that's taken care of by somebody else these days. But these are the things that we talked about when we talked about RIFRA. And um, we really thought at Americans United that it was important to have this because it protected mostly minority religions. These are the groups that really needed the help. And our position is that we do support some religious accommodations if they ease a real burden on someone's religion, not something made up. Um, they don't advance religion, so they don't give like a particular um, um, advantage to religion. And most of all, the most important, is that they don't harm other people. And if you looked at all of those examples, none of those things harmed other people. Um, just like there was a Supreme Court case recently about whether a prisoner could wear um, a half-inch beard and we said, yes, you should have that religious accommodation because it's not hurting anybody else for this person to have a, a half inch beard. <coughs> so RIFRA passes, things seem fine. In 1997, um, there was a case that challenged whether or not RIFRA could stand, and the court said RIFRA is constitutional as applied to federal money and the federal government, but you can't enforce it in the states. And this was a question about congressional power or something, we can talk about that another time. But the important thing is to know that the federal RIFRA applies to the federal government, to Washington, D.C., but it doesn't apply to the states. So that's why states started coming up with their own RIFRA. So in the, in the late 90s, states started instituting these with the same idea that we had. This is helping minority religions, and it's necessary. Well, shortly after, there was a case that came out of Alaska that sort of made people start scratching their heads about RIFRA. And in that case, it was a landlord, and the landlord argued that she didn't want to rent out rooms to unmarried couples because that would violate her religious beliefs to um, endorse unmarried couples living together. So she sued, and in the lower court, she won. 
<laughs> and that case ended up getting thrown out. Again, sort of complicated, um, unnecessary details. But suddenly, some of us started saying, wait a minute. We, it never occurred to us that anyone could use RIFRA to get around a non-discrimination law. So we started feeling a little concerned about RIFRA. So Americans United and the ACLU and other groups changed their position on RIFRA. We've never opposed the federal RIFRA, but when RIFRAs were being passed in the states, we started taking the position that you couldn't pass a RIFRA that mirrored the federal government's RIFRA because it might cause problems like this. So for years and years, AU has been saying, if you're gonna pass a state RIFRA, you need to have provisions in there to protect against discrimination, against, you know, to, to, to up, uphold civil rights legislation. So that's been our position for a long time. <coughs> so over the years, this has been coming, we've been saying this and saying this, and um, recently it is becoming more obvious to people that RIFRA is being misappropriated. And it's being misappropriated mainly for discrimination and in pub the he public health arena. The, the most obvious example of this is the Hobby Lobby case. A lot of people know about Hobby Lobby. A lot of people know what it is. But most people I've talked to have no idea that this is not a straight up free exercise case, that it's actually a RIFRA case. So the bills you see in Indiana and Arkansas, that is what Hobby Lobby is all about. So Hobby Lobby is a RIFRA case. And for those of you who aren't familiar with it, this was about the insurance mandate that if a, a, um, an employer was going to cover insurance for their employees, they had to cover contraception. And they did have, um, and they still have, some religious exemptions in there. So if you are a house of worship, you don't have to provide insurance coverage for contraception for your employees at all. From the rhetoric you hear about this, you would never actually realize that, but houses of worship are totally exempt from the insurance mandate coverage. If you are a nonprofit organization, you're not fully exempt, but what you have is called an accommodation. And so all a nonprofit organization has to do is fill out a form and say, I don't believe in that, I am not covering it. And then what happens after you fill out the form and the government knows is the government has your insurer, their insurer cover it instead. So the women still get health care but the nonprofit doesn't have to inform them, pay for it, nothing to do with it. And then of course there's for-profit corporations and they have to provide it. So Hobby Lobby, a for-profit corporation um, that you know, sells crafts, says this violates our religion. We're, we're a, a, a for-profit, we are here to earn money, but we, re we live by a religious code and we refuse to provide insurance coverage for women. And we believe that we're gonna get out of this because of RIFRA. So again, those of us who supported RIFRA in the past said, for-profit corporation, that is absurd. No one ever talked about for-profit corporations at the time of the passage of RIFRA. This is not what we meant. This is not what we thought. Um, this is outrageous. And how can um, a corporation have a religious opinion on anything? Um, in fact, the whole point of a corporation is to say the person and the corporation are separate entities um, so that you don't have to pay any of their debts or anything, why do you get to put your religion um, into your corporation? Well, though we had really good signs and um, we filed a really, I thought, impressive brief, we did not win this case. So <coughs> after Hobby Lobby, the new era of RIFRA is that for-profit corporations can utilize RIFRA and that they can get out of things like providing women health care even though it's causing a real harm to women. So this is our, our big problem with this is it, you shouldn't be able to harm other people. And this is clearly causing a harm to women. And then we have all of these discrimination issues with RIFRA. Some of them are the obvious issues that a lot of people know about. Um, the private business cases. So you see these a lot in the states based on, on state RIFRAs. So there might be a human rights ordinance that says you cannot discriminate against someone because they're gay, and a business says, well, I'm not gonna serve you, I'm not gonna give you flowers for your wedding because it violates my religion. I'm not gonna be a photographer at your wedding. I'm not gonna allow you to stay at my inn. There's a, a bunch of cases around the country um, where people are saying, I get out of non-discrimination laws because of RIFRA. Now, we have won all of those cases so far, but think about the fact that they are all in pretty progressive areas, progressive enough areas to, to have a non-discrimination law, 
And so their judiciaries are a little bit more progressive than say Mississippi, Alabama, places like that where they elect their judges. Um, so we still have that really, get, that concern that they're gonna be used this way and that is the rhetoric that we hear behind the bills that are being passed now. But RIFRA is also being used um, on the federal level, level right now to fund um, discrimination. So on the federal level, the Bush administration adopted a policy that says in all of their, their uh, social service programs, so I should back up and say that the government partners with religious organizations um, a lot to perform social services, and the Bush administration came in many years ago and they knocked down a, a lot of the church-state separation provisions um, that we thought were very important, and we're still fighting to have them reinstated by the Obama administration. And one of the things that he really focused on is discrimination. So prior to the Bush administration, if you were a religious organization and you were performing social services, say, you know, helping with a homeless shelter, <coughs> serving soup, you could not, you, you had to hire on a neutral basis. You couldn't say, I'm only, you know, I'm, I'm a Lutheran, so you can only hire, I'm only gonna hire Lutherans. Um, the Bush administration came in and changed all of the regulations that he could affecting this. So all the regulations still today, Obama has not changed them, say that if you're a religious organization taking taxpayer money, you can discriminate. The basis for all of this, the justification for all of this is RIFRA. And the Bush administration also put in place um, an Office of Legal Counsel memo, again, some DC legal mumbo jumbo, that um, says that even if Congress says, so for um, the Violence Against Women Act, for instance, they just passed it. There was a huge fight about non-discrimination, whether there should be a non-discrimination clause or not. Um, Senator Leahy won. It was his non-discrimination provision that said, if you get bylaw law money, you could not discriminate in hiring. Well, there is a memo that the, the Obama administration has not gotten rid, of, gotten rid of that says, RIFRA trumps that. And so under RIFRA, even though they just passed this two years ago under RIFRA, <coughs> that is null and void for religious organizations. So that is another discriminatory way that RIFRA is being used today. And then post Hobby Lobby, some groups have taken this now and they are claiming not only should I be able to discriminate in hiring when I take this money to perform government services, I shouldn't actually have to perform any of the government services under this contract that I don't like. So currently we are working on, um, the, the administration is, is passing regulations for human trafficking and the, um, the, the Catholic bishops have submitted comments saying, I understand that trafficking victims perhaps need reproductive health services and things like that, but we would like to get the grant money, um, but we're not gonna provide any of that. And we think that RIFRA tells us that we don't have to inform these victims of trafficking about any of the, the services that we don't like, which means that they wouldn't have to inform them about the morning after pill, any reproductive services, um, birth control, anything that you would think a victim of, of trafficking in particular would need. So that is sort of the next step of arguments about RIFRA. So that's where we are in RIFRA. Um, <coughs> so that's how, this is how we get to Indiana. There's all of this stuff. We have the women's community making progress with um, reproductive health with the, the contraception mandate and marriage equality making huge strides. And so then we see the backlash. And then we see with Hobby Lobby, the case law is changing. So not only is it the, the atmosphere, but there's also the legal atmosphere that is changing. And the bills are just filled with rhetoric behind them. And then some of the bills are trying to actually change the language to tweak it a little bit um, to even favor themselves even more. And then, so you know we have all these sides moving and then the business voice comes in and that is why this finally, after many, many years, ended up on Meet the Press and This Week in Washington. Um, and in our office, we like to say that we fought RIFRA before it was cool. Mm -hmm. Now it's very cool to dislike RIFRA, um, but it's been very exciting for us because, you know, we, we this is gonna keep continuing, this is gonna keep being the fight, but it is finally something that people are really paying attention to. And so my hope is that they are taking it a step too far and now, now our side is gonna be able to push back. So what you saw in Indiana and Arkansas, <coughs> Indiana had a RIFRA, and they made it a little bit different than the federal RIFRA by putting in some of the things that they found from Hobby Lobby and a few other things. 
So suddenly, the business community finally catches on and everyone freaks out and it's amazing and it was great to see the community, it was great to see the LGBT community engaged and the, the women's community engaged. Um, but a lot of people, and of course, the business community, I think my, um, Barry Lynn gave a talk on this the other day and he said that Governor Pence, who one day said he was gonna sign the bill and the next day said he wouldn't sign the bill, had nothing to do with free exercise, it had everything to do with the final four, had everything to do with money. Uh, which I think is true in the case of Indiana. But a lot of people are saying, oh, Indiana's fine, they totally fix it, they have a non-discrimination clause, isn't that great, we totally won. We didn't win. I mean, we won some. It was way, way worse when they started. But the non-discrimination clause does not take care of a lot of the problems we have with RIFRA. First of all, it doesn't even fully take care of the, the LGBT community concerns because it has a big religious exemption in it. Um, so it takes care of the concerns for for-profit organizations, um, but not a lot of the religious um, organizations. So we still have the women's concern. We have the whole Hobby Lobby concern. We have the concern about government contracts going to nonprofit groups and getting um, out of the law. All of them so it still exist in, in Indiana. And Arkansas, which was going on at the same time, what they did was they said, well, we're just gonna mirror the federal law. And a lot of people said, oh, the federal law, Bill Clinton signed that, and Obama was fine with that 22 years ago, so no problem. Well, the mirror, if it mirrors the federal law, that means it has all of the problems that I just talked about still in there. Um, so progress that people are talking about it, progress that people are getting upset about it, and we tweak them so they're not as bad as they started, but we still didn't get nearly as far as we need to. Um, and we're seeing these refusals <coughs> not just in the form of a RIFRA, so the RIFRA applies to everything, but we're seeing them targeted particularly at marriage. So there are bills out there that say, um, judges, you know, you're supposed to, in clerks, you're supposed to give out marriage licenses. You don't have to if it violates your religion. Um, adoption agencies that get taxpayer money. Oh, you, you don't have to adopt out to a same-sex couple if you don't want to. Same thing, they target medical services. They um, have targeted just public accommodations in particular. We see bills that will target student clubs and say that religious organizations, um, religious clubs at, at universities should be able to discriminate against their members even though all other clubs can't. Um, and we also see bills targeted at, this is troubling, student counselors. So if you are going through a, a program to be a counselor, um, you have to serve everybody. And there are lawsuits out there from counselors who say, I'm not gonna serve anyone who is LGBT and um, I want an exemption from that requirement and there are bills out there that would give them that exemption. And then we have the same sorts of things on the federal level. So we're, we're following all those bills in the states, and then in the federal level, we have some bills out there. We have an adoption bill that would say that if it's a federally funded um, adoption agency, or that states are not allowed to require their state-funded adoption agencies to adopt same-sex couples. We have a really unique situation in D.C. Um, D.C. is a place where Congress really likes to experiment because we still have this very strange relationship with Congress where they can actually come in and um, change our rules. They do it with the, the budget. They will change our budget all the time. And they give us money and they tell us we can and can't do things. And um, they have the right to pass a resolution of disapproval of any bill the D.C. Council passes. So we, we get no vote. It's very hard living in D.C. Um, so our D.C. City Council passed two bills last year, one which says that religious schools don't have to recognize LGBT clubs, they don't have to fund them, but they do have to give them space to meet if they give other clubs space to meet. So not formal recognition, no money, just give them a room. So we passed that, and we also passed something that says that employers can't discriminate against women based on their reproductive choices. So you can't fire a woman because she's getting in vitro fertilization. Um, you can't fire a woman because um, she's a single parent, Think, you know, those sorts of things. Well, Congress has decided, um, and a senator you might have heard of, Ted Cruz, has decided right. that these things are very offensive and that they want to use the power of um, disapproval to negate these rules. Um, so they actually had a hearing in the House on this last week. 
um, and we're, we're seeing where it's going. But that's sort of another way of them, even if you put in there some positive protections for people, Congress is trying to knock them out. Um, we are also fighting <coughs> attempts at removing protections. So every time a bill that comes up that has a non-discrimination provision in it, we have to fight to keep that non-discrimination provision. And of course, we're also fighting on the administrative um, policy area to get to get Obama to fix these rules that the Bush administration put in place, um, which is very hard. And every time a law passes, every time a reg goes through, we fight each one of these issues. Um, so that that's sort of what's happening on the refusal area. Um, the second issue I wanted to talk about specifically is education, and. Um, we're, we're seeing a lot of, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act is up for reauthorization in Congress. And that is the bill that is all the federal funding for all K through 12 programs in, um, around, that they give to the states. And so vouchers just come up constantly. Um, so we are spending tons of time at Americans United fighting against vouchers. Um, some people don't realize all of the tricky ways that we now have vouchers. So we have vouchers for all students. We have them targeted. They'll, they'll pick a, um, a group of students that seem particularly vulnerable, that you don't want to get out there and say, I, I voted against um, something that's good for military kids or kids with disability or foster kids. So they will target them um, to these groups. We also see backdoor vouchers, which are tuition tax credits, education scholarship funds. And now we have this thing, as I said, called portability, which I'll tell you a little bit about. Um, so most people know about the traditional voucher. It's taxpayer money that the government gives to a student to go to private school. It's pretty obvious that it comes out of the public treasury, obvious to how you see, see it work. But then we have tuition tax credits, and this is what your governor has endorsed, um, and, and some people in your state. And what happens there is that a business or an individual gives money to a scholarship fund, and then they get that money right back in the form of a, of a tax credit. And the scholarship fund gives the money to a student. So lots of people will say, well, this isn't a voucher because it's not taxpayer money. Well, it's the exact same as taxpayer money. Instead of collecting it and giving it to the student, they are just not collecting it and having you give it to the student. Um, so it's still money out of the public treasury that could go to public schools or to other things um, for the betterment of the state. The new thing we have <coughs> is called portability. So, and it's Title I portability. And Title I, for those of you who don't know this, I didn't know this until I had to know this, um, Title I is an area of, um, it's federal money that goes to schools with high concentrations of poverty. So they have a lot of kids in the school that are, that are in poverty. And the idea is that if you have one or two kids in poverty, you know, that's, that's hard, you've got to help them. But when you have high concentrations, it is a unique experience and really hard for the school to handle. And if you target the money to those schools, you can hire a, you know, an extra special ed teacher or an extra um, um, English as a second language teacher to help those kids. So the way it originally works is it's a pot of money that goes to the school with a lot of kids. What they're trying to do in Congress now is turn it into a voucher. Um, Instead, it's a pot of money, and each kid gets the same amount of money. So it's not pooled anymore. So each kid now is worth you know, $100, and it goes to those kids, which doesn't really make any sense because one of these kids might be living in poverty but going to a very wealthy school, depending on what their public choice, um, choice um, programs look like. Um, but what we know about this is that they're really not, they talk about how it's um, gonna follow the kid. Now that is the same exact language they use about vouchers. And we know that what they're really trying to do is turn Title I into a voucher because all of the original bills said, Title I can be, go to public and private schools. And when they couldn't pass it, they said, oh, we'll just send it to public schools. And once we sort of destroy this program, then we'll send it to private schools. So Americans United, who has never worked on public school portability issues before, um, is now very much fighting this Title I portability issue because we know the goal is really to turn it into a voucher. Um, I should have mentioned that Americans United is the co-chair of the National Coalition for Public Education, which is the national, or it's a national coalition that fights school vouchers. There are 50 plus organizations. Um, it is 
you know, the uh, Reform Judaism and Baptist Joint Committee, NAACP, the NEA, AFT, um, a big range of organizations that fight vouchers. So there's tons of reasons to fight vouchers. Um, and I just want to touch on a, a few of them because I think that they're particularly important um, to talk about. So, of course, the first issue that we all think about is whether it's unconstitutional. You hear a lot of times um, that you know the, the money, of course, goes primarily to religious schools uh, and all of these voucher programs. So I hear a lot of our friends and advocates say that it's unconstitutional. Well, unfortunately, under the U.S. Constitution, we have a case out there that says that at least the, the situation um, uh, um, in the zone uh, case is constitutional. Upheld a voucher scheme if they have a true independent choice. But in 38 states, actually it should say 38, not 37 states, they have stronger establishment clause provisions actually than the US Constitution has. And so in those states, you still can't have a school voucher program because they specifically say that public money cannot go to private sectarian schools. New York is one of them. So you guys have the special protection. So you guys can say, though you can't say that vouchers violate the US Constitution, you can say that vouchers and tuition tax credits violate the New York Constitution. Um, and even if it didn't violate specifically the Constitution, we still feel very comfortable arguing that it violates the principle of church-state separation, that your money should not go to fund, tax, taxpayer money should not go to fund religious education. Um, but then there are the other reasons that you should not be supporting vouchers, which is that they don't work. Um, if you look at study after study around the country, it shows that vouchers do not improve reading or math in kids. Um, voucher schools have fewer resources, and that teacher, they have black teacher curriculum, and they, um, um, they just don't improve at all. <laughs> They're just not helpful. Um, and they also don't help public schools. An argument I hear all the time is, our public schools are failing us. We need vouchers because we need, to, we need to improve things. Well, vouchers aren't improving anything, right? It's not any kind of reform. They're just giving money away from the public schools. They're not fixing anything that is supposedly wrong with them. Um, they're just sending a few kids out the door without fixing any problems. And vouchers lack accountability. There's usually no reporting, no testing, mm -hmm. no accounting for funds, no teacher standards, and um, you know, something we were talking about at, um, in my office today via email is about teaching of creationism, especially in Louisiana schools. There's no standards for what they're teaching these kids. Um, and of course, there's also quality controls. If you look at the DC voucher, their administrator of the, prob of the program actually referred to this as a blind spot. Um, and of course, you know, what, what could go wrong? If you look at vouchers around the country, we have, we have evidence of vouchers paying for cars and televisions. We have vouchers um, going to special needs kids um, at schools that don't actually have any special needs teachers. We have schools without working bathrooms. That was a situation in DC where the kids had to go to another classroom or another building in order to use the bathroom. Um, we had schools in DC taking voucher funds even though they didn't charge their kids tuition. Um, of course, we have schools teaching creationism. Uh, there was a school in Louisiana that essentially just took a cart in and showed videos. Um, in DC, we had schools where you would go and there were no certificates of occupancy. We have schools with teachers without bachelor's degrees. Um, <coughs> I can't remember which state this was, but they showed schools housed in old gas stations. Oh, this one you can't even read. Mm -hmm. um, what does that even say? Oh, they, they, would, they would take vouchers for kids. Sorry, I should have made that um, change the font. Uh, they were taking vouchers for kids, but if you actually found out where the kids were, they were still in the public schools, even though they gave the money to a, a private school. Uh, this is a common thing that happens. A school will fail as a charter school, and they will reopen as a private school, keep the same kids, and take government money. Uh, Wisconsin paid out $139 million to schools that don't meet their requirements. And then in Indiana, $4 million of overpayment that they only found out about because the schools actually gave the money back to them. Um, which, I mean, they're really lucky because they actually even have a provision in their, um, in their law that prevents them from doing investigating to see if there's any problems in the program. <laughs> so this is what your taxpayer money could be going towards. Um, and then students lose rights. IDEA, which is protect, 
uh, protections for kids with disabilities. Private schools don't have to adhere to most of that. They don't have to have the least inclusive environment. They don't have to follow their IEP, was their individualized education program. Title IX protections for girls that were put in there, they don't have to abide by most of them. They don't have due process. They don't have free speech rights. They don't have open records laws. All of these things your taxpayer money would be going towards. So those are some of the reasons why you should really, really hate vouchers and you should really hate tuition tax credits. And actually, tuition tax credits are even worse because at least with vouchers, I can't believe I'm saying at least with vouchers, but um, at least the, the money is going, there's a program set out, so you kind of know where some of the money is going. With tuition tax credits, you don't know anything because the money never comes into the government, and so you don't really know what those scholarship funds are doing at all, where they're going. Um, in Georgia, they have a program, and nobody has any idea if it's working, if it isn't working. I would argue it isn't working. But um, you know, you can't you can't tell. You don't know where the money's going. So here's some of the fights that we are having on the federal level. The first is the DC voucher. The DC voucher, as I said, they like to play with DC in Congress. The DC voucher is the only federally funded voucher in the country. And they do it because they can do pretty much whatever they want to do to DC. Um, so Several years ago, they made this deal where they said, we will give you $20 million for the voucher program, but we'll also give you $20 million for your charter schools and for your public schools. Our, um, our mayor at the time said, that's a lot of money, and so we'll take that. Um, but they barely passed it. They actually passed it um, through the House one night when most of the Democrats were at a um, a debate. It was a presidential debate in Baltimore, and that is the night they passed it in a Republicanly controlled Congress by one vote. So even with all the Democrats gone, and even it being controlled by Republicans, they only passed it by one vote. Um, but we still have that today, and Americans United has been fighting very hard to get rid of it. But it was started as a pilot program for five years. Um, we almost killed it when Obama came into office. He said he didn't like it. Um, he, it was a little bit problematic because instead of stopping the program, he said, well, let's just let the kids who are in it stay. And we said, well, you mean, you know, if you're in kindergarten or in your school into third grade, then you go back to public school. And he said, no, in <coughs> high school. So we were like, well, that's never going to end because you're going to have a constituency forever. Um, and actually, uh, Speaker Boehner, it's one of his favorite programs. It's one bill that he actually put his name on, the first state of the union. He, he invited as his guest um, uh, uh, people from the Archdiocese of Washington, D.C. And, and D.C. voucher students to be his guest. So that's how much he liked this program. So when this was about to be reauthorized, it was the same time that the government shut down. And one of the bargaining chips that Boehner used was he wanted the D.C. voucher reauthorized, and he got it. Um, so this all happened when we were doing so well, and then the government shut down, and this got put in there to reopen up the government. Um, but again, studies show it isn't working. Um, it's a bad program. It has all sorts of accountability pro problems. The Department of Education actually did, a, did five years of studies on this, found it didn't make any difference, um, but that is not persuasive in Congress. Um, for all these groups that say they don't want to spend taxpayer money on programs that don't work, um, that don't have accountability to the taxpayers, they love vouchers. Um, so they're getting ready to reauthorize this again. Um, and every year we have a fight in the Appropriations Committee. So every year we are fighting this about how much money to give to them. Another bill, this is a Tim Scott bill uh, from South Carolina. He has the Choice Act that he keeps trying to push. It would expand the DC voucher. It would take IDEA money, that's what the money that goes to kids with disabilities, and would turn that into a voucher. That is particularly troubling because as I said, kids who take vouchers um, with special needs, they lose all of the rights that they have under IDA when they go to a private school. Um, so it is touted as helping them, but it actually strips some of their rights. And um, it would also create a military voucher program for you know kids who um, come from families in the military. And then there's um, Senator Alexander's bill. He would repeal 40 national programs and turn them into vouchers. So essentially, it would be this big block grant that you can just use for vouchers. Um, it is 63% of the money currently spent on K through 12 would be a voucher to go to private schools if you want to. Um, and then as I said, we have the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. This is the one thing that is really <coughs> Um So in the House, the House 
Um, the bill was on the floor. It has Title I portability language in it, so that's the, the money that would go to kids, supposed to go for kids in high concentrations of poverty. It would destroy that program and allow the money um, to be portable. It had no vouchers in it. Um, it was interesting because Boehner is always, as you know, in this very delicate situation where he is trying to appease his moderates and he is trying to appease his conservatives. And so he knew he would lose too many moderates if he put the voucher in there. So he decided not to put, it was you know, sort of from above, no vouchers, even though there were vouchers introduced, none got voted on. Um, and it ended up that he still couldn't get the bill through. So when you would read articles about it, the conservatives would complain that there were no vouchers in it, and the moderates would say, if you're gonna make it any more conservative, I'm not voting for it. And this is one of those instances, I, I you probably hear people in you know, DC world talking about how you never put a bill on the floor if it's not gonna have the votes. He put the bill on the floor and he had to pull it before it got voted on because he didn't have the votes. And this was several months ago, and he still hasn't been able to bring it back to the floor. Um, so that's where that is in the House. And then the Senate, <laughs> they recently moved their bill. Um, originally, it had Title I portability language in it. They stripped that. Um, it was in a, a committee. They had voucher amendments, but they never voted on them. And um, essentially, what they said was Senator Alexander said he was going to put a Title I portability amendment on the floor. And um, Tim Scott said he was going to put a Title I voucher amendment on the floor. So in June, in Congress, we will be having most likely two votes on vouchers on the floor of Congress. Um, so that's where we are there. Um, and then vouchers come up all over the place, just like church state stuff actually comes up all over the place. Um, a lot of my friends are lucky. My friends who work in education, they can focus on the education committee. They know everybody in the education committee. They know every bill that comes out. Um, but church state stuff is all over the place. We have National Defense Reauthorization Act. We have vouchers that come up. Um, appropriations bills, budget resolutions, our stuff just pops up everywhere and we just have to be really vigilant and look for it anywhere it might come up. Um, and then of course you guys, um, you have in New York the education investment tax credit bills, which your governor has been trying to pass. Um, there's two bills. It's my understanding that it has passed in the Senate and is not passed in the House. Um, it's, and you guys probably know this better than me. And it's also my understanding that they tried really hard to get this into your appropriations bills. And um, there was a huge fight and there were actually lots of Democrats who said they weren't gonna vote for the bill unless it had this tax credit in there. Um, and of course, lots of them saying that they wouldn't vote for it if it had the tax credit in there. They ended up not putting it into your appropriations bill, but there is still time, I believe your um, legislature goes out in June, but there is still time for them to pass this. And essentially what it does is it says that if you give money to a scholarship organization, you can get a 90% tax credit for every dollar you give, up to a million dollars. And in a few years, the cap on this will be $300 million. But he also did something to make it seem, I think, a little bit more appealing where he said, um, half the money has to go to public schools, half the money would go to private schools for these donations. So it reminds me a little bit of D.C. where they say, oh, well, look at all this money that's going to go to the public schools to try to entice you to give $150 million each year um, of tax, what could be taxpayer money to the private schools. Um, so that is still, as far as I know, being fought right now um, in New York. And that